right. Fresh haircut. <clears throat> Looks good. Howdy, everyone. Thanks for stopping back by the channel. Really appreciate you being here. Today's video, I've teased in a couple of other ones that we were going to talk about my first fight at TDCJ, also known as officially a use of force. This video is going to be a two-part series because there's just a little bit more to cover. I want to paint a picture of how it leads up to it, how it plays out in the aftermath. I don't want to make this a one long video that you have to sit and just dwell through. So I'm going to break it up into two parts. So we'll go ahead and paint the picture. In the academy, we're taught about use of forces and how they can occur, when they can occur. The best thing I can say when they're going to occur, strictly random. That There's no way to tell when a use of force is going to kick off. It's, it's just going to happen. Usually, it's going to be a surprise. The Academy teaches the policies and the procedures of what to do after a use of force. They teach a lot of defensive tactics. The critique I have for it, and I'm sure that's changed now, most of the tactics that they taught back then, in fact, pretty much all of them, were standing use of forces. Most fights end up on the ground. You end up at some point in a bear hug, you're on the ground, and now it's a tussling match. I would like to think that they've incorporated some elements of some Aikido, some Judo, uh, some MMA, shrimping, crawling, if anybody wants to know about any of those tactics, you can look those up online, Wikipedia search. Back then, it was all standing. So, Academy teaches the policies and procedures. You get to the unit, it's on you. Now, there are different kinds of use of forces, things that lead up to a use of force. There's CO to offender use of force. There's offender to CO. Offenders... Inmates are not allowed to touch COs at all, ever. If you're standing there holding a gate open and an offender happens to walk past you and passively put his hand on your back, that is an assault. It's to be treated like an assault. The offender is supposed to be written up accordingly and done so from there. The only time that I could see offender making contact with a CO and making it justified would be if a CO is involved in a fight and the offender is trying to help out with an assist. All the use of forces that I saw, that was never the case. Offenders, inmates did not help COs out in use of forces. Usually, if there were a bunch around, they would just stand off to the side and let whatever happened happen. One, it was safer for them. If a backup CO happened to show up with pepper spray and there were offenders around, everybody was going to get sprayed down. If the offender was standing off to the side, at least in the offender's defense, they could say, I had nothing to do with this, nothing at all. I wasn't involved in the least bit. It was a way for them to protect themselves. So, we beat that dead horse here. CO to offender... Use of forces escalated when there would be a type of assault. Now, physical contact with offenders occurs every day. I would venture to say, as a CO, you will be making contact with offenders probably within your first hour, if not less, from coming on shift with these individuals. You're either going to be patting one down, searching him, or breaking up a use of force or involved in a use of force, which I hope is limited for anybody involved in this industry. There's a lot of patting down going on. You're searching these guys for contraband, anything that's been smuggled out, trying to stop and slow that flow. Okay, Those don't constitute use of forces. At any time, a CO at TDCJ can stop an offender that's moving, tell him pat down. Offender's supposed to turn around, arms out to the side. You pat each arm down. Start with the torso. You're behind the offender. Hands go to the torso, down, around the waistband. Take each leg, go down to the foot. Other leg, go down to the foot. Knife hand, 
thumb married to the hand, not straight up, thumb married, straight up the inside of the leg, all the way up into the junk. You got to get up close and personal with these guys, and you can't be timid about it or shy about it. As a new CO, the inmate's going to say stuff to you. They're going to talk all kinds of mess, talk all kinds of trash, try to distract you from what you're doing. The ones that are talking the mess to you are usually the ones that are smuggling stuff. You got to get up close and personal with these guys. That's just the nature of the job. Those aren't uses of forces. Use of force would occur if, same scenario, you're patting an offender down, you're searching him, and he pulls away. Any kind of resistance, any kind whatsoever, steps away, doesn't stop, that's resisting at that point. You have to gain control of it. If you get control of the offender and he continues to resist, that's a use of force. Use of force entails there's a lot of paperwork, there's a script that has to be talked out and worded. Usually the supervisor would do that. Paperwork has to be filled out. Time, location, what you were doing, what the offender did, and how the outcome came from there. Unfortunately, there is a lot of paperwork involved with use of forces. It's not like you could just scenario, you get ready to pat an offender down, he pulls away, you push him up against the chain link fence, he says, I'm done, you pat him down, you send him on his way. If you do that and you don't file appropriate paperwork, the offender can file a grievance that the CO assaulted him. And now you're going up for charges for excessive force on an offender. Academy teaches that. It's also covered in the use of force class when you first report to the unit. So that's the background for how use of forces are going to occur. The way that mine took place, it didn't take long. I've done a lot of videos so far. We've talked about it. You're probably thinking, well, Jesse, how long did it take you to get into your first fight? Day two. Second day. Child time. When I say child time, I mean the noon meal. This is where I'm going to lead up to and trail off into the second part of the video. There were five of us going through OJT at the time. We were still doing our unit tour, working with the different units, and every time at lunchtime, wherever we were, we would stop, we would leave that area, we would go to the chow hall area. If you remember in a previous video, I talked about four chow halls, A side, B side, chow hall one and two, gate, center picket, where the center boss was controlling the gates, gate, chow hall three and four, B side. There would be a supervisor on both sides. So let's paint the picture for the number of COs. Four chow halls, each had a CO assigned to them. Locked in there. All right. So we got one chow hall. Correction. We got one CO, four chow halls, four COs. Supervisor on each side, we're up to six COs. Center picket boss, seven COs. All right. Just in that small area. Plus the ones that were walking to and from where they were going. A lot of COs would be assigned to buildings, pickets, dorms. Others were rovers. They were called utilities. They would escort inmates, move around, or just respond to different incidents. Excuse me. So we're up to seven COs, and now we have the OJT guys. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. We've got 12 individuals in gray all in this area. Should be pretty secure, right? No offender's going to want to act up when there's that many COs in that area, right? Yeah. Anyway. So, at chow time, when we would get there, we would try to break up into even numbers. There's five of us. Can't do that. Three and two. Three of us were on A side. Correction. Three were on A side. Two of us, me being that one individual with the other one, were on B side. A side typically had more offenders. They were a little more behaved. I use that term very loosely. They had less offenses within the unit, so they had 
a little less restrictions imposed on them. It was a privilege to be on that side. B side, B side had a building. You're going to hear the term, and I haven't talked about this at all, you're going to hear the term eight building warrior. These are offenders that because of their offenses, because of their classification, because of their conduct, they should have been in segregation. But segregation can only hold so many inmates. So where do these guys go? They go to eight building. Probably the most unruly crowd that you can have. Eight building was always rock and roll. Always. So on B-side, you had these offenders coming out to eat in the chow hall, along with seven and six buildings. The benefit to it, there were a little less inmates. When I say a little less, there might have been 500 of them. The other side, maybe 1,000. Keep in mind, Styles had at least 2,900, 20, I'm sorry, 2,920, 2,920 offenders assigned to it. So there's three over on A side, two of us staggered out over on B side. Our job as shots of inmates would come out. A shot of inmate was supposed to be a group of 25 of them. As they came down, pull them off to the side, pat them down. We couldn't get every single one. When you got one, the rest of them would speed up and try to get on past the line so they couldn't be next. So you grabbed as many of them as you could. The supervisor that was out there had the keys. It was called a Folger key, not the key that goes in the door to your house. This is a long key, probably about as long or so as your hand and thick metal. It went in, it turned, door opened, supervisor would, the key stayed in, supervisor would shut the door, turn the key, pull it out, tug the door, door was locked. Supervisor would then go to the next chow hall, open the door, as he's letting, or she, could be both, as the supervisor is letting inmates out, inmates are, f correction, as the supervisor is letting inmates in, the CO inside the chow hall is letting offenders out. It wasn't supposed to happen at the same time. Sometimes it did. That was to try to prevent inmates from passing things to each other hand to hand, also to prevent assaults. This offender couldn't grab this offender and such and such. So we're out there patting down as many of these offenders as we can. B-side got a little bit slow. I don't remember who the supervisor was over on A-side. On B-side, it was Captain Boykins. I knew Captain Boykins previously. The unit was in Beaumont. Kind of a small town. It wasn't uncommon to run into people and to bump into each other. When I went to the job fair at the convention center, he was there. I met him, got to talk to him. Now, I'm working beside him here at the unit. Captains typically didn't work outside the chow hall. They didn't typically work buildings. Usually, it was sergeants and lieutenants that were in charge of the shifts. Captains supervised administrative work. There was a captain over segregation, captain over general population. They would supervise count. Captains also worked as, um, what was it called? Detention hearings. When an offender had a grievance against another offender or a CO, they would go before the hearing officer. This was typically the captain. The captain would review the case and go from there. Why Captain Boykins was working outside the chow hall, I don't know. The only thing I could really assess to is maybe there was a shortage of supervisors that day. Maybe one got called off to another situation. I wasn't privy to that information. All I knew was there's a captain out there. Being prior military at the time, being prior military, I thought having a captain out there, we're good. Offender's not going to act up with a captain. There's some kind of an aura around supervisors. A lot of inmates are going to say, I want to see some stripes. I want to talk to some rank. I don't want to talk to you. I want to see rank. When the supervisor shows up, then the offender usually started acting right. So I'm thinking, we're great. I got the captain on this side. B 
B-side had gotten to a lull and there were less offenders coming in and there were a bunch coming through A-side. Captain Boykins calls two of us over there and says, look, we got a lull right here. I'm going to send you. I don't remember the CO's name that I was working with. It's a female. I don't remember her name. I remember her face. I remember what she looks like. She was really cool. She was really good at what she does. I hope she's still there doing great things. I hope she's moved up in the ranks. Tells her, go on over to A-side, work with them. Carter, you stay with me. I highly doubt his decision was based on my superb skills as a CO with detaining and <laughs> patting down these individuals. I really think it was random, the decision that he made to send the CO over to the other side. Now, there's four COs over on A side. I'm on this side with Captain Boykins. Supervisors didn't pat the offenders down. It was the OJT's job to do that. So now it's just me. Now we start getting a couple more shots coming in, and I'm doing everything that I can to pat as many of these guys down. I got the captain out here. I'm trying to look good for him, I'm brand new. I'm doing everything I can. It's freaking July. It's hot. I'm sweating just sweat pouring down, trying to pat these guys down. And I remember the offender coming out of the chow hall in a group. I pulled him off to the side. I got his arms. As I'm going down his torso, I remember patting his waistband and hearing him say, hey boss, cap needs you. Whatever, man. Offenders would say anything when you're patting them down. And I go to work down the guy's leg. He says again, Hey, boss man, a hey, cap really needs your help. I said, well, I looked up at him. What the F word are you talking about? I can't say what he said. Dumb MFer, look over to your side there. Turn your head. I look. Captain Boykins is on his back. He has an offender on top of him, and they're tussling around. I saw his radio laying off to the side. I saw his keys laying beside him. Other inmates, they're just walking past, going on like nothing's going on. Just perfectly normal. I stand up, I look, and I've just got this awe in my face going, the captain's being attacked. I never thought that a captain would be assaulted by an offender. And also, in my mind, I'm day two, I'm OJT. I'm not supposed to be standing in a building. I'm still in training. This is the second day. There's no way this is happening. And as I'm processing this, this offender is on top of Captain Boykins. He's laying on his back. One leg is out straight. I just stuck my leg out like you can see it. You can't. One leg is out straight. The other leg is bent. Foot's on the ground, and the leg is, is crooked up. He has his arms wrapped around this offender. This offender has both elbows on top of them, and they're just rolling and tussling, and they're laying on concrete. What I do from there is what we're gonna cover in the second video. Folks, I really appreciate you checking out this content. Thanks for being a part of this. I really hope that these videos are helping everybody out that's watching. I hope that they're entertaining. If there's more you'd like to see, please let me know. Click a like, click a subscribe, help me out, helping you guys as I make this content. Next up, we're going to finish up part two with how I reacted with this situation and the aftermath from it. Thanks for watching. I really hope everyone has a great day. Y'all take care of yourselves.